used to do Q&A on fifth Sundays, but we took a little break. We're going to go back to Q&A next year, though, 2020. But finishing off this year, we're doing Great Commission Sunday. We're a missions church. But the traditional missions mind often is Jennifer, Sarah, and Aaron in Mexico. That's missionaries. But the kingdom perspective is we're all missionaries. We're all called. Your job is your mission field. You've been anointed and appointed because God wants to fill the earth. That means he wants to be everywhere. These four walls is not it. The whole earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So he wants his people equipped and empowered to serve him everywhere. And everywhere is where? Everywhere. Amen? So there's something called Seven Mountains, but we've changed it to represent our acronym P-R-A-I-S-E. And each of them represent a different area of society. Because the Bible says in the Great Commission, go ye into the world and make disciples of what? Nations. So what is a nation made up of? Of course, people. But what influences people? Culture. And so we need to influence and affect the culture that we live in. And every one of us are in different areas of the culture. And so God wants to use us and anoint us, not just to have a job and get a paycheck, but for ministry and for purpose and for the advancement of the kingdom. We do that by applying truth in every area and every problem. God gives us solutions. It's character. It's serving with the right heart and the right motive. All these things spread light and penetrate and make a difference. So P represented politics or government. R represented the church or religion. I taught the first two. The last one who taught was Jonathan who taught about arts. He's a very artistic guy. And arts is a big shaper of culture is the arts. Hollywood, radio, music, TV, all these things really shape how we think. So we want God's people in the arts. Now today we're going to deal with I, which represents the intellect, education. As we're going to hear today, education is probably the biggest shaper of who we are, how we think, how we behave. So we need God's people in the education mountain. And because a lot of us have pulled out because the mentality has been tradition, missionaries do this, they go overseas, and we said, okay, everything else, the devil, you can have it. But that is no longer the way. That's not the kingdom way. God wants his people everywhere. Amen? So I would like to bring somebody who is an expert in that field. They might not say they're an expert, but because God is in them, God is the expert and he's in them, so therefore they can receive that in Jesus' name. So we need somebody that's an instructor in the education field. And there's quite a few of you. But today I've chosen Maria Castillo to be our speaker. Amen? Welcome her. open in prayer. I wrote this prayer yesterday as God gave it to me. Heavenly Father God, we acknowledge you today, your sovereignty, your greatness, your omnipotence, omniscience, and your omnipresence. Permeate this place today with your spirit of truth. Let every person in this room hear what they need to hear from you, whether I say it or not. Well, yesterday as I was making the final touches to this, I thought I had it pretty set and suddenly God said I want you to change what you're going to do at the beginning <laughs> don't you love that so anyway um, suddenly I just received this poem and it's called ascend it says wherever you are and wherever you go and whatever your work for each day your true motivation should lie in the goal to love and show others the way the way to the father through Jesus the son the way to salvation in him and may you not tire, grow weary, or weak. May the light that you shine never dim. For out in the world there are lost who are buried in mountains of lies and deceit. But never lose heart or succumb to the lie that we live in a state of defeat. 
Yes, there are hardships, and yes, there is pain, and sometimes we just want to hide. But trudge up those mountains to bring forth the truth and remember who walks by your side. Thanks. It's really God's poem. <laughs> Came to me so fast. But anyway, in the past few months, like Josh said, we've been um, interspersing in between the weekly sermons lessons about the seven major areas of society that influence greatly the way people think, act, and view the world. They're called the seven mountains. So the um, slide up here shows them church, family, education, government, media, arts, and business. And we've been talking about how the enemy has just been infiltrating these areas uh, with ideologies that are false, often false, and often extremely destructive. So the Lord is saying our, our eyes need to be open to these mountains and to the falsehoods that emanate from them. So as Christians, you know, with a, with a Christian worldview, we're called, though, to function in the world. So we need to have our filters constantly on. And we have to always be ready to sift through what is thrown at us as truth. And so second slide shows, I got this picture of a sieve, you know, and just all the stuff that comes at us, you know, have your, have your filter on, have your sieve ready, whatever image you have in your mind about how to get rid of, let, we sang a song which said, let, let what's not of you just fall off, and I was thinking about that, and I was thinking, you know what, I'm going to start praying that at the end of every day, <laughs> or at the end of every experience where I perceive that stuff was dumped on me that's not of God. Well, you know, 2 Corinthians 10.5 um, says, We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Yeah. So he calls us to do that. And education and some of the philosophies behind it are definitely lofty. And not in a good way. Sometimes. Okay, so Josh asked me to talk about the mountain of education because I've been teaching as a college instructor for many years. And I, and I, you know, I love to learn and I love to teach. I love my students, I love my institution, but I can tell you I see firsthand how th so often theory and philosophy are taught as truth, right? And we're supposed to be believers in the infallibility of God's truth. But you know, I was sharing with Pastor Steve we got together and talked about this presentation, and I said, you know, so often I feel like I'm caught in two worlds, caught between two worlds. Almost like, you know, my husband's from Venezuela. We have somewhat of a bicultural home. Two things going on at once. Sometimes those cultures can clash. For example, they drive differently in Venezuela. <laughs> my husband's a great driver. But sometimes he'll do some things that I know come from the way he was taught to survive on the autopistas in Caracas. So anyway, that's an example. But, but where I work, I often feel like I'm just in between these two worlds, and I have to constantly be on guard. And I wrote this, careful of what I allow to seep into my being. And you know, when I wrote that, I, I highlighted that word seep, and I thought about it for a minute or so, and it just gave me the picture of a, of a slow subtle, sometimes almost imperceptible leak or drain coming in, you know? Some things look so true, you know? So that's why when you work in a secular environment, which I'm sure I am not nearly the only one here, we just have to be so careful. Okay, so we're going to talk about this mountain of education. Can you put the next slide? The mountain, I put, it's the Mount Everest of the seven mountains. So that's Mount Everest. You know, and so, of course, they're all important, you know, and they all have their negative influences, and they all have their positive influences. But I put that up there in thinking about Mount Everest because I, I attended a conference um, with Roberto a few weeks ago about teaching and learning. It was wonderful. It was engaging. And some things I had to really filter but I got a lot out of it. But one of the comments that really stuck with me on the natural and the spiritual level was that teaching 
makes all other professions possible. And I thought, wow, you know, that's really true. Because, you know, I don't, te and I think that's especially true for at the elementary, junior high, high school levels where your students are gonna go on and become all kinds of things, professions, okay? But anyway, as I, it was kind of sobering to think about the range of influence that education has. And they're far reaching, you know? You know, and I have slide, next slide, I saw this image of like concentric circles sort of showing the spheres of influence. So I think about, you know, what I say to my students in my class, and you know, students generally still think the teacher has truth. So I, I am always careful, I try to always be careful. But anyway, so here's, here's how it looked to me. It's like, you know, there's me, and I'm teaching my, my class, or I'm teaching my children, in this case I'm talking about school, and then they take that out to the local community, then they take it out to the nation, and then it goes out to the world, <laughs> you know? So there's a crucial thing to remember here. These, these things that are taught as absolute truth are not only in the natural realm, but they reach out into the spiritual realm as well. What do I mean by that? Well, I'm thinking facts and figures are one thing. And I want to stop here and say that I, I'm not bashing knowledge, gaining knowledge. I'm not at all. Knowledge can be a wonderful thing. I wouldn't be in education if I didn't think so. God does want us to learn all about the world that he created and the systems that he put in place. We have to be aware, though, that when learning goes beyond measurable facts, we enter into beliefs. And believe me, belief systems and sp are spiritual matters. They're either founded on God's truth or they're not. Yes? No. They either are or they aren't. So again, I'm going to say we have to be filtering what we, what we hear and what we learn. Well, education has changed a lot throughout history, and that could be a whole three-hour teaching, okay? But I have some couple of cartoons just for a chuckle. Because, first of all, these, co these little comics represent how we've had to change our strategies in order to reach millennials. So they're a little bit funny. This one shows um, a teacher scowling at her student who's on the phone, and it says, let me call you back, the teacher's distracting me. <laughs> it's funny, but it's not, you know what I'm saying? It's just true, it happens. Okay, and the next one, there's two boys at the back of the class, and they're both holding books, and one says to the other, psst, how do you turn this thing on? <laughs> right? A lot of students these days don't bring books into the college classroom. They bring their laptops, which enters into a whole world of distraction. But anyway, okay, and the next one, the boy's in the front of the room, and, you know, remember traditional show and tell? Well, he's going to do show and text. Why bother talking? I'm just going to text everybody what's important about this thing I'm going to show you. <laughs> okay. But anyway, so that's, that, let's talk now really about the purpose. That's, that's, this is funny. This is about how we do have to think about how millennials now learn. We have to look into the science of how long their attention spans are and, and try and adapt somewhat, otherwise you lose them. And that's just a fact whether we want to uh, cater to them or not. I do sometimes. But anyway, so now we want to look at how the purpose of education has shifted throughout the years. And again, that's another long teaching. But um, we want to relate these changes to the mountain of education. So I wanted to start with just a couple of definitions. Next slide. The, here's a contemporary definition of uh, education. The process of facilitating learning or the acquisition of knowledge, skills, values, beliefs, and habits. I can tell you right now that there's a very big trend in education to move away from teacher-directed learning to student-directed learning where a teacher's a facilitator, that's a little hard for me to adapt to. But anyway, a lot of changes are going on in education. But, but you know, um, that's kind of a, temper, a contemporary definition, but let's look at the root of that word education. I like to do that to see what the intent was originally. Because we look at the Latin, and there are two roots for the word education. The first one is educare, which means to train or to mold. And um, the, other, the other definition, the other root is um, educere, which means to lead out. So with the first one, when I 
looked at that, I, I immediately got a picture of, of a student as a piece of Play-Doh and the teacher just molding that student. So make no mistake, we are shaped and molded by how we're educated. No matter how we go about it, homeschool, private school, public school. But I kind of prefer the second one to lead out because it reminds me of Proverbs 22, 6, which says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. And of course, you know, that slide talks about raising up our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, first and foremost, but also, you know, education will lead them to their futures. You know, education is there to introduce them to different things, to find out what their skills and talents and gifts are, and to lead them in the way they should go. And I said this at the last service a couple of months ago, a couple of weeks ago, actually, my daughter, Lena, said to me, you know, people have been telling me all my life, you can do whatever you want. You can be whoever you want to be. And she said, I finally realized that that's kind of a lie. She said, you know, I can't be anything I want to be or whoever I want to be. I can only be who God wants me to be. And wasn't that a revelation? It really was huge for her because in a way it took a lot of pressure off. You know, and I, hey, I found myself saying that to my kids. And now I'm going to preface it by saying you can be who, whatever God calls you to do, you can do that. So, you know, it's been a little bit of a lie. Well, actually, a big lie. All right? All right. So I don't have a lot of history about school, but the first one in the U.S. was established in the 17th century. Its purpose was to teach boys to read the Bible. So again, it would take a lot of time to go back through the stages. I did read up on it, very interesting. But suffice it to say that three major prestigious institutions in the U.S., Yale, Harvard, and Princeton, were founded upon biblical principles and for the purpose of um, to dis disseminating faith and truth from God's word. They're no longer focused in that direction at all, as you, I'm sure you know. So what's the focus today? That's the question. What are the foci? There are a lot of foci in education, but let's talk about some of them, okay? And what I want to talk about are these big, next slide, isms, the big isms of today, okay? So they're taught directly or indirectly in schools from kindergarten through higher ed, in the textbooks, in the curriculum. And listen, at their root, at their, at college, at their, at their root, what they do in large part is question the authority, goodness, and even the existence of God. And we need to know this. So I'm gonna talk about each one of them a little bit. So humanism prioritizes and prizes human qualities and intellects. Kind of puts man in the position of God. You know, man is his own God. A man can do it, and man is good at his root. And then rationalism, which is the one I have dealt with most, rejects dependence on faith or supernatural or divine things, okay? It's not the intelligent view. If you can't prove it quantitatively with research, with numbers, with uh, statistics, then it's foolishness. And, you know, I saw that this was used in the Garden of Eden. You know, when the devil contradicts what God told Eve, her instructions, he's asking her to question God's logic. And she succumbs to that. She's like, yeah, really, that really doesn't make sense. You know? That's a silly command. You know, students are told, use your brain. Be rational. Um, but then when you come forward and say, I believe it, and I obey it just because God said it, it's not really acceptable in education. I had a, my son was in a philosophy class, and the professor said, if your answer to any of these questions is because of my faith, okay, but you, you can't just leave it there. You have to expound on that. You have to, in a way he was fair, you know, he gave them the audience at least to expand on it, but you know, he was in effect saying underneath that all was, you know, that's not enough. It's not enough to say, you know, my foundation is here, and I build upon it. Liberalism says that, really, liberal has its, has its root in freedom, right? Liberty. It says that freedom and pleasure trump morality, right? So really how we look at it is freedom from God's restrictions. If it feels good, do it. If it doesn't hurt anybody else, do it. And agnosticism teaches that, hey, reality's unknown, it's unknowable, God probably isn't real, 
And even if he is, you can't know him. He doesn't really care. He's just, you know, out there, you know. And I was reading about this orphan mentality. And that's really, that's really when Josh says, you know, we're, we're, we're to penetrate these mountains to reach orphans. Because these people think they don't have a father. They might have an earthly father. Maybe they have a good one. Maybe they don't. If they don't, then they have no father. And so we're, we're, we're dealing with people all day long who are really spiritual orphans. And atheism, atheism says, you know, God just doesn't exist, period. That's it. So I want to go backwards with these, and I want to debunk these lies by using scripture, okay? So atheism says, of course, you know, there's no God. But the foundation of our faith is that God does exist, and he created all. So you can see John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In John 1, 3, all things were made by him, and with him was not anything made that was made. We stand on that. And in agnosticism, next slide. We believe that not only does God exist, but he wants to be personally involved with our lives, that he lovingly leads us. And, you know, we want to just keep reiterating that his motive is love, his motive is love, his motive is love for his children. And, of course, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever should believe in him shall have everlasting life. A loving father would say that. Then liberalism, which says just, you know, if it feels good, do it. But we believe that for our own sake, for our own protection, for our well-being, he tells us that not all actions are permitted. You know? He wants obedience, but not just for the heck of it. He wants obedience because, again, his motive is love. And I put this uh, Deuteronomy 28.1, which I love. Now it will be if you will diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments, which I am commanding you this day, then the Lord your God will set you above all the nations of the earth. What a great promise for obeying. You know? And rationalism, well, God's wisdom is often irrational to man. And I, you know, I went on a long trail thinking about this, about how our victory so often depends on seeking his wisdom and then acting on his plan without questioning when the solution, when the wisdom that comes forth seems so irrational, <laughs> seems not like a kind of plan you'd get from an intelligent being. So I put these examples, you know, Joshua, the Battle of Jericho, that battle plan was not one that um, would be army strategy these days. Okay, and then um, in John 21, Jesus comes and knows that the disciples have been fishing all night but have not caught fish. And so he says to them, you don't have any fish, do you? No, we've been fishing all night. Cast it out again to the right, to the right. And what happens? When they do, even though they are probably thinking, all right, I've already, I'm the expert fisherman. I've been fishing all night with my expert fisherman buddies. But what do they do? They pull in so many fish, the net can't hold them all. And then in Matthew 17, when Jesus uh, tells Simon Peter, listen, we need this tax money. Go out, cast your net. The first fish will have a coin in it. That's where we're going to get the money. And in John 9, 6, well, we all know Jesus healed a blind man by spitting in the mud. So that's God's wisdom. So humanism, well, we know man is not God. He's the creation of God. Genesis 1.1 says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And in Genesis 1.26, God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. So how do we as Christians operate in this world of education and stay true to our beliefs? It's not easy. It's really not easy. And, I, and, and wherever you work. So I'm talking about education, but wherever you work in the secular world. And sometimes even in a Christian environment. So, yeah, because there are falsehoods flying around everywhere. But right now I'm just speaking to students. Are there any students still in the room? Okay, okay. Or, or anyone really working in education. There's some things that you need to remember. Okay, first, always remember, and this, these seem so obvious, but like I said, untruths seep in and sound good. And we just have to, we have to be reminding ourselves of the basics even sometimes. Well, he's the creator and we're the creation. His word establishes truth and not man. Next, next slide. 
we should seek knowledge for three main reasons. I felt like God gave me this. To learn more about our creator through the study of the world that he created. There's a famous quote. I think it was, I'm not sure who said it, but it might have been the woman who, it might have been Maria Montessori, but I'm not sure. But anyway, she said, the world is so full of a number of things that I'm sure we should all be as happy as kings. So no doubt, God has filled this place with wonderful things to explore and to learn. But you know, for what purpose? And the second thing, we should seek knowledge to help solve problems in our own lives and in the lives of others, okay? Doctors, nurses, lawyers, teachers, whatever you do, you're solving problems all the time. And the third reason is to enjoy the wonderful world that he gave us to enjoy, you know? But I wanna talk about uh, for a few minutes, the difference between knowledge and wisdom. A little segue there into knowledge and wisdom. Could spend a lot of time on those two as well. But um, yeah. So here's a definition. It says knowledge and wisdom are different. Knowledge is knowing a tomato is a fruit, and wisdom is knowing not to put it in a fruit salad. So it's a kind of a little chuckle thing there but um, you know what do you do with with knowledge it's how you apply it that it becomes wisdom and we have to remember that wisdom trumps knowledge wisdom trumps knowledge in in the next slide I have some in the next slide uh, there's a contemporary definition of wisdom the ability to learn from change, generally accepted belief. That's the world's definition of wisdom, and as well as knowing what to do with tomatoes when, once you realize they're fruit. But then I really like the biblical definition of knowledge. It's the word sophias, and the definition of that is insight that is not naturally attained. That's what we want. We want the wisdom of God. There's a scripture that says in Ephesians 1.17 that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give, impart, give over unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. And in Proverbs 3.13, it says, blessed is the man who finds wisdom, the man who gains understanding. So I want to talk to uh, you educators um, especially those who would maybe get in trouble at work for speaking about your faith. And that could be me sometimes working at a university. I do have to have wisdom. So this is what I say to do. Seek the Lord every day for strategies. And of course, this applies to everybody, right? Everybody knows that. Please seek the Lord each day for strategies and ask him how you can shine forth with Jesus without being direct when that's necessary. And ask the Lord to open doors of opportunity to share your faith. And I shared earlier this morning that I began to pray that prayer a few years back. I pray for open doors of opportunity to be a wisdom, a light, and an example. And when I remember to pray that in the shower in the morning, every time without fail, I have an experience where God sends me somebody and I'm able to share. So I, I encourage you to, he answers it every single time without fail. I get home at night and I say, I'll, I'll go back over the day and think, oh, wow. That's what that was. I won't not even realize it at the moment when it happens. You know, if a student or a coworker asks your opinion or your advice, which, which you hope for because then you have license, let him know about the way you approach the issues of life through your faith. Ask for permission to share, right? These opportunities can arise in different ways. So I have a couple of things to share. Uh, three things. Uh, when my brother died a few years back, um, you know, I was grieving, and my colleagues were coming to ask me how I felt, how I was doing, and I had complete license to tell them everything, <laughs> because they asked me, and no one's going to fault a grieving woman. No one's going to report a grieving woman for saying, if I didn't have God to help me through this, to know where my brother is going to spend eternity, then I couldn't face this. And if I thought this was all there was to life, I couldn't face So those kinds of things that are truth for me, I, was, I had those open doors. Another time I had a really weird experience, not long after my brother died, where a young woman was not feeling well in my class all semester. She kept asking to leave. and So one day she left. 
she emailed me and said, can I come speak to you today? And I said, sure, come by. She comes to my office and she sits down. I'm thinking, we're going to talk about grades. We're going to, you know. And she says to me, I hope this is okay to say. And I said, you can say anything you need to say. She was very polite and respectful. So she said, the reason I've been so ill all semester is because your dead brother's been talking to me. And so she said, and she was so respectful and polite. She said, I'm sorry, did I offend you? Did I offend you? And I was like throwing up prayers like you wouldn't believe. Like, God, I need wisdom. God, I need, I was just, because I, I was in shock. And so I said to her, I'm not offended at all, but can I tell you what I really think about this? And she said, yes. And I was thanking God for that because then it just poured forth. I, w I felt the freedom to tell her anything and everything about my faith, about Jesus, about salvation, about demonic influences, everything. So um, pray for those opportunities. And the other thing that happened was at the conference that I just went to was a group of colleagues, and it was so interesting how God orchestrated it. At the end of the evening, um, I can't tell you the whole thing that happened because it was like a two-hour process where God just like filtered a group of 10 people down to one. And we just got to talking in the middle of the hotel, and she broke down. This is a professor with a PhD and published, accomplished, everything, wonderful person. I love her, broke down about her particular issues, and I said, let's sit down and talk. We talk, I let her talk. And then finally I said to her, could I pray for you? And she, she said, I don't know. I said, okay, if you're not comfortable, no problem. And then she said, yeah, but go ahead. And when I prayed, when I was done, and this brings tears to my eyes, when I was finished, she said to me, it just, it just struck my heart because she looked like a little girl. She said to me, how did you know what to say? And I thought to myself, and, and, not, and not a judgmental or criti critical way, just truth hit me like, you can have 25 PhDs, but if you don't understand that you can sit and talk to God your Father, it doesn't mean anything, you know? And it was such an unbelievable experience, and she said, and I said, and I told her, I said, you could do the same thing. You can talk to the Lord, he's your Father. She said, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know what to say. So I tried to explain to her, just tell him your heart. Just tell him you want him to show you who he is. So that was just an emotional experience for me. Um, where am I? Okay. Um, okay. So another thing. So in, in, in speaking about, you know, sometimes it's not possible to use words. So here's an example. Sometimes students come up to me and ask me why I don't curse in class. They really do. They say, how come you don't curse? How, can, how come you don't teach this lesson, you know, and make it more, you know, which makes me think what's going on in the other classrooms. But I said in the, pre in the previous services, this is not my business. You know, it's not my business. I just don't do that. And, I, and then I can tell them why. Well, it's not pleasing to my God. Not that it never happens. And I tell them that. Every once in a while, something slips out. But in my lifestyle and the way I want to please the Lord, it, I don't want to do that anymore. And so I've had students uh, approach me and ask me about the cross that I wear or the water bottle that I carry that um, shows the place we go on vacation every summer, Christian retreat place. It opens up a conversation. If students ask me about how was your weekend, I, I try to mention, oh, we were at church. It was a good mission. My kids sang or whatever. You know? But I want to say this too. Don't forget, wherever you work, whatever you do, it's not just Christians that need, it's not just non-Christians that need the encouragement. I found that, that in my classroom, uh, my Christian students are looking for signs. We almost like look for each other in a certain way. It's kind of interesting. Yeah, we sort of spy each other out. We listen to, you know, there's certain terminology um, that indicates maybe a person's a believer, but I've had students come up to me and say, I saw your cross, are you a Christian? Yes, oh, I'm so thankful to have a Christian instructor professor, you know? So they need that encouragement too, and I do too. I love to know there are Christians in my room. You know, I've had, I've discovered that and we've agreed to pray for the class and that's wonderful. So pray for the people that you influence, whether they're students or coworkers, you know, and I wanna talk for a minute about John chapter four, the woman at the well, which is a chapter that's ministered to me in so many different ways on, in, in, on different occasions in my life. Most recently when I went to the DR on a missions trip, um, I was studying to prepare a devotional about that. And the Lord really showed me this. He showed me, you know, when Jesus said, I have need to go through Samaria, he had an appointment. 
with one woman. And God really showed me this time around when I was headed to the DR to pray for the one. Because it was so amazing to see this aspect of Jesus where he didn't reveal himself on a mountaintop. Sometimes he did, but this time he didn't. He didn't reveal himself to Samaria to an audience of hundreds or thousands. He picked the one that he knew would go spread that message. So I say, so that's what I started to do. Pray for the one. I mean, if God gives you a stadium of people, amen, that's your place. But I found that praying for the one has been really interesting and really rewarding. Because you remember what happened. He gave, he gave her the gospel and she went back to town and all the townspeople came back. And you know what they said? They said, we come, we've come here because we've heard about Jesus, but, but now we need to hear for ourselves. So it starts it going, you know? All right. So if you're an educator, a counselor, administrator, a staff member, pray over your office space. If you work in a place where there might be a Christian organization, let's say you're a student at a university, seek out those organizations so you can feel girded up. If you're in a position to affect curriculum, pray for wisdom about how to influence in that area. Um, we can't always control the content of a textbook. You know, I can't. Um, I can't control what comes in the textbook, but I can choose some things not to cover. So we don't, we don't have time for everything. So I can pick and choose. And my example has been that every time I go to teach the future tense in Spanish, there's always an activity uh, of fortune telling. And so I just gloss over that, I'll do that one. But I was thinking as I, after the first service, I was thinking when I went to teach English in Brazil, I was not a believer yet. And I was teaching that concept in English, the future tense. So I thought that would be fun activity, and let's read each other's palms, just for fun. I wasn't into fortune telling or anything. Two young people in the class, a couple, said, I'm sorry, we can't do this activity. This goes against our beliefs. And I thought they were like, okay, all right. You're ruining my class. You know, that was my attitude. But now when I ever see them again, maybe not till glory, I'm going to tell them thank you because you were right. You know? All right. I have, if I have the time, I really, I really want to talk about this and read you some things from Sparkling Gems. Do I have a few more minutes? Do I do? 12.15? All right. I, I really uh, feel like this is going to bless everybody, I think. Um, the message for everybody here, no matter what you do, is, is get wisdom. It really is about getting wisdom. And I want to ask you this. Have you ever felt intellectually inferior? I have to say, I have to confess that I do pretty much every single day I go to work. And I have to, I, I respect my colleagues for the work they've done. I really do. They've worked hard uh, and they're scholars. But I'm not, I'm not a scholar. Let's just say, I'm not a scholar. Okay? I'm an educator and I do the best to impart what I know. But God shows me, like I said all the time, that PhDs aren't everything. Wonderful if God has you in a place and says you need a PhD to do this thing. You understand what I'm saying. I'm not, de I'm not bashing knowledge, okay? But you know, I can't get a PhD in this stage of life. I really can't. But I can have the wisdom of God. And like I said, I was going to, I told you the story about the professor at Stockton. So I, I, you know, which just broke my heart, that whole interchange, that whole interaction with her. So I encourage you all, though, to, to value godly wisdom above all and to rejoice that it's really the most valuable treasure. And it's there for the asking. All right? So when you're dealing with the mountain of education, the mountain of business, the mountain of religion, you know, interject wisdom. James 1.5 says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But I want to go to my, I love this book, Sparkling Gems from the Greek, because what he does is he breaks down a lot of the Greek to show what was originally intended in some verses in the New Testament. So in, in 1 Corinthians, I think I need my glasses for this. In 1 Corinthians 1, 26 and 27, it says, For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. So in ancient Greece, when it talks about noble, okay, this, 
this verse in the Greek, when it mentions nobility, it meant, you know, sons of kings, politicians, or others of the upper crust of society. Okay? But it says, you know, God didn't call those people. Jesus didn't call those people. You know? So I think that you should be encouraged in that. We all should be. Um, if we're not exactly in that upper echelon in the world's view. If you take a look at world history, you'll see that God hasn't primarily specialized in using kings, queens, royalty, politicians, scientists, philosophers, writers, and movie stars, and celebrities to advance the kingdom. Sometimes he does. But he's reached out to the hearts of ordinary men and women. I was thinking about this. I was thinking about why. I think that maybe he chose the disciples, the men that they were, because he didn't have to get all the stuff out before he put all the truth in. <laughs> Sometimes that has to happen. You have to get the stuff out that's not of God. So, you know, knowledge. Okay? So, um, what else did I want to tell you on that? Remember that the early Christians' lack of polish made them look stupid in the world's eyes. Okay? So the, the, uh, the Roman emperor at first looked at Christianity as the re religion of stupid poor people because it grew rapidly among the lower slave classes. They were ready to receive it. So therefore, even though you may not have any genius residing in your genes or, or nobility running in your blood, that isn't a strike against you. You can lay claim to the factors. Sorry. Um, God isn't looking for people who are geniuses or well-born, high-class blue bloods. He's looking, and this is the key, for anyone who will say yes to his call. So I wanted to say that. All right. So I am going to close. Um, in closing, there are two scriptures I want to talk about. Um, our motive, as I said in the beginning and through the poem, our motive for influencing the mountains or for in influencing anybody, anything, should be love. It really has to be love. And a, and a, for the lost, and a desire to see them meet and trust Jesus. Above all else, the spiritual orphans of the world need to have a saving knowledge of God. And so when I was you know, preparing for this, um, yes, um, I kept finding this <laughs> scripture on my refrigerator. Like, I've been thinking about this, pondering it for months, you know, asking God to put it together. And I kept seeing this scripture in Thessalonians. I thought, no, it's not really related, God. I don't know if I'm going to put that in, you know. But now I realize that it really is the main thrust. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as our God does for you. And another scripture, which is in Colossians 1.13, which, by the way, I did some research on whether it's Colossians, Colossians. Both are acceptable. Okay. Says, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of his dear son. And this is important because for a couple reasons. The world tells us that education is king. It really does. And the other thing is the devil would have us focus on this looming darkness that's around these mountains. He would tell us we can't possibly scale them. But we have to remember who we are in Christ and that we operate an influence from a place of victory. Whether our sphere of influence is education or another vocation, another mountain, our job is to bring Jesus to the mountain. Billy Graham said, only Christ can meet the deepest needs of our world and our hearts. Lasting peace, peace with God, peace among men and nations, and peace within our hearts. Father God, I just pray that this message would Whatever it is you want everybody to receive from this message, would just seep into everyone's spirit, a good seeping. God, and it would stay with us. And God, just show us how we can heighten our discernment, how we can just filter everything we hear through your truth. And let us walk away today feeling as though we can because the word says we can. I just pray that this week, everyone in this room um, is an influence for you because we want to make Jesus known. I thank you and praise you, God.
In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Maria. You all feel empowered and equipped today? So that's why we're here, to be empowered and equipped to serve everywhere. Praise the Lord. Let's, if you need prayer today, there'll be people up here to pray with you. All of us are influenced by what we hear, education. We're all in that field. We're all being educated. We're in the age of information. So if you do need prayer, there'll be people here to pray with you. Go out and serve. Fellowship with each other on your way. God bless you and have a wonderful week. Amen.